Today's video, we're going to take a look at the ABIT BP6 motherboard, the board that brought SMP processing to the masses. We review old technology from games to old PCs and don't forget the doll. We do those old generation electronics. We cover it all. So I suppose the first thing we should do is look at the motherboard in question. This is the motherboard that this whole build uh, is based around. Now this board uh, I have right here in front of us, this is actually an extra I have. Uh, this board currently is not working. Um, I believe the issue has to do with the capacitors uh, are bad. Um, that's kind of a common problem with motherboards in general from this era, uh, but this board is known to have issues with the capacitors. Good news is, usually if the capacitors are changed, the board will come back to life. Hopefully one day I would like to get these capacitors changed and uh, bring this particular board back to life. But right now we're just going to use this one as our example uh, motherboard. Now this board is the A-Bit uh, BP6 and it was released in 1999. Its claim to fame is basically it brought the dual processor uh, configuration to the masses. Now there were dual processor boards before that used SMP processing, which is two actual physical CPUs on the motherboard. Uh, I've seen a couple uh, Pentium 2 um, dual CPU motherboards. I've even seen original Pentium motherboards. I, I believe even they went back with 486 and even 386 possibly motherboards that had the two physical CPUs on the board. Um, the thing though, those boards were really relegated to professionals and high-end workstations. This here was the world's first Socket 370 uh, dual CPU board, and it really made the dual CPU configuration uh, affordable to the masses. Um, so that's kind of this board's claim to fame. Now it did that by using two low-cost Celerons. Um, now I'm going to butcher the pronunciation here, but it used the Mendocino core uh, Celerons, which are kind of the low-cost variation. Well, they were meant to compete with the Pentium 2 as a low-cost option. Uh, unlike earlier Celerons, these ones had 128 uh, K of L2 cache, and they're pretty good performers, and they're generally pretty easily overclockable. Now, one interesting thing about them is with the simple mod, they were capable of uh, dual processing, so it was it was uh, SMP capable. Now, not all CPUs were capable of this, but these Celerons were. Um, so, this board, uh, A-Bit took advantage of that fact, and they, they came out with this board. I believe this board only supports the Mendocino uh, Celeron CPUs, um, and it uses some kind of voodoo trickery that does uh, allow, uh, kind of like the mod is built into the board, uh, as far as I know. Uh, maybe it doesn't need a, maybe they just do it without modifications in other boards, but I think there was some sort of very easy um, mod that had to be done. But this board just does it for you, basically. And um, you get, you can get two low-cost Celerons, and suddenly you would have uh, dual CPU support. Um, now this board will take uh, later uh, CPUs that fit the socket. I believe it will take copper mine. Uh, Celerons and Pentium 3s as well, at least the earlier ones uh, with an adapter. I believe, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but out of the box I believe this board only supports the uh, Mendocino, or however you pronounce it, uh, Celerons. Now these CPUs do have a front side bus of 66 megahertz. Um, they are overclockable. Uh, this motherboard does allow a range of overclocking. You can turn the front side bus up to 100 megahertz and more, but these are uh, locked multiplier CPUs. Uh, the ones installed currently are 333 megahertz, but this board will take up to the highest uh, clock speed of these that were released, which is 533 megahertz. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the rest of the board. Uh, we have three RAM sockets here. This board will take up to 768 megabytes of PC66 or PC100 RAM. Uh, we have uh, AGP slot here. This is AGP times 2. Uh, we have some PCI slots and some nice 
16-bit ISA slots if you want to use this machine uh, for DOS and things like that. It uses the Intel 440BX chipset, very nice stable chipset from Intel. Uh, we have a floppy connector here. We have these two IDE connectors. I believe these are ATA33. And then we actually have two more uh, that use this high point chip here to control these. And these are ATA66, I believe, so a little bit faster. So in total, this board will support up to eight uh, IDE devices. So two for each one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. CMOS battery here. And that's about it. So yeah, this is a really... Uh, kind of nice uh, board in general, uh, ATX board. Uh, if we turn it here, it doesn't have a lot built in as far as like video and sound, uh, but it does have your standard PS2 ports, two USB ports, two serial, and one parallel port. So yeah, overall this is a kind of a nice um, motherboard. Now we do have some issues as far as, you know, SMP itself is concerned, and we'll talk about that in a minute as far as like OS and things like that. Now the one thing we do need to consider when this board came out in 1999 is even though this did bring uh, SMP processing to the masses, uh, the problem was Windows 98 was kind of the main um, operating system out of time, especially if you're into gaming. And unfortunately, that operating system does not support the dual processor mode. So if you wanted to take advantage of that, you would have to use a operating system other than Windows 98. Now, Windows 98 would work on this board, but you would only be getting the power of one of these processors. If you wanted to use both, you would have to use something like, uh, well, Windows NT, uh, Linux, I believe certain other operating systems that support it. Um, uh, but again, not really gaming-centric OS's there. Uh, Windows 2000 and XP did end up supporting these, but then the problem is uh, these are Celerons. They might be a little bit weak for uh, later Windows XP and Windows 2000 uh, applications, and especially games. But again, early, uh, early 2000s, these CPUs should perform fairly well. Uh, the other issue is game. So even if you had an OS that supported the dual CPUs, many games did not. <laughs> so that the support for uh, multi-core and multi-physical uh, CPUs did not come till later. So you did have that problem, although there are a few notable titles that did support the multiple CPUs. Um, so yeah, that is a general uh, look at the board itself. Now let's look at the uh, PC itself. And if we look right here, I just wanted to point out, this board does feature a uh, Sound Blaster Link connector. Um, so if you're using a PCI sound card and you're planning to do some DOS applications and whatnot, you can use, if the card uh, you're running supports it and you have the cable, you can connect it to this and it should increase your compatibility with uh, DOS applications. Now. It's not as useful seeing as they're already 16-bit ISA slots, and if you're really planning to run DOS on this a lot, um, you could always put in a 16-bit ISA sound card. Uh, but I guess if your primary focus would, is Windows uh, you know, 98 or 2000 or XP, which might make sense uh, seeing as this is much more of a Windows-centric board, and you've got, well, powerful as far as DOS goes uh, CPUs, you may prefer to use a PCI sound card so you get better support uh, with Windows, uh, which you'll probably be using uh, mostly on this board. Um, so I guess it is nice that you have that little option that uh, if you do use a PCI sound card, uh, you can increase your compatibility a little bit. So if we take a look at the top of this case, there's actually still a piece of paper uh, taped to it, and this is the original owner. Um, when I found this, the original owner had this tape to it, and he was kind enough to put the specs uh, of this machine on there. So he is classic dual CPU overclocker. Uh, he even put, I mean, he knew what he had. He even put ABIT BP6 plus 2 CPU uh, times 2 Intel Celeron 366. Uh, these are the original CPUs that were installed. Uh, I, I have tested this board. I have opened this machine up. Uh, currently, I have replaced them with 533. Uh, megahertz Celerons. That's the fastest um, official Celerons that we'll uh, install on this board, although uh, we may do some overclocking uh, with those. 
uh, Sound Blaster Live 5.1. This is these are all still installed. Uh, Adapt Tech uh, 90 2940 uh, SCSI card. System works though currently no video card. I have installed a video card. Um, current CPUs overclocking to 550 for years. Uh, less so now. Um, I mean that happens uh, over years. The the board sort of uh, wears out. I guess you know overclocking can be hard on these boards. So I'm not sure what he means by that. I never actually it, when I had these originally installed, it it booted up fine. Um, I don't remember if they were overclocked at the time though. But anyways, uh, the 533 megahertz ones in there now are working just fine. Um, motherboard manual included. Um, I think it was included. I don't know what I did with it. It's around here somewhere. <laughs> See also, oh, don okay, he donated other things to, um, I picked this up at a swap meet where people donate things. So he donated some other CPUs, um, which I think I, I think I picked those up. I don't, I don't quite remember. But anyways, yeah, those, that's the original specs when I grabbed this machine. So and I took a quick peek on where I thought I may have stashed this manual, and indeed, it was there and I found it. So, uh, cool, we do have the BP6 uh, user's manual, which is, it could come in handy, it's, it's pretty nice. Alright, so here is our tower with our A-bit uh, BP6 installed in there and all the cards. Now, it's probably a little bit tilted here, again, it's on the workbench bed uh i you know it, it's pretty unstable i've got it on that piece of uh like plywood um but it's slowly sort of sinking it's making me very nervous because it is quite heavy i don't want to fall over especially with the dogs moving behind it so i'm going to be keeping a close eye on this i'm going to try to make this part brief but yeah this is a big uh tower this is originally what the board and everything came in when i picked it up um this is I mean, this looks like, you know, a workstation server type tower, uh, although I, it's kind of a newer design, I think, although I don't know the year of it, um, but it's very nice. I like it. If you see right here, it does have a LED display. Um, right now, I think it's defaulted. I think it just says 999 up there, um, but that's really nice to have like a three-digit LED display on kind of a newer case. Don't see that too horribly often. Um, this is the power button, uh, reset button. Uh, I don't quite know what this is. It, it has a lightning bolt on it, and it's really, you can't get to it with just your finger. Um, maybe that's the reset button. I'm, I'm just assuming this is the reset button, but maybe it's not. Maybe this is a turbo button, and, and that's a reset button. I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that a little bit more, but... We've got these two buttons here, and then, like I said, the LED display here, too. Um, I believe also the power LED and the hard drive activity light are within this little LED, like, little space right here as well. Uh, so, very tall tower, space for a badge. I haven't put anything there yet. Nice little side stylings. And then we have this, which folds down, revealing a cornucopia of bays so we have one two three four five five and a quarter inch bays and it is two measly three and a half inch bays um again uh this is what how i found it i haven't swapped anything around or anything yet uh like the only thing i've done to this is i've swapped out the cpus for the faster uh celerons but um i think that's about it uh, looks like a Plextar CD drive. I don't know if this is SCSI or IDE. Uh, two hard drive bays. Uh, we have another uh, CD drive here. It's blank, so I'm not sure if that's a DVD or a CD drive. Uh, this little sort of USB port hub thingy with four USB ports. And then, of course, you've got to have a 1.44 megabyte. Uh, floppy drive. Just a quick look at the side there. It does have some nice little stylings and there are little feet on this as well. Before we open up, here's the bottom of this case. And we have these little feet and they kind of fold out and back. Um, so I think if you fold them out like that, you're going to get more stability, I believe, um, like doing that. But you could also, you know, do that uh, if you want to if you don't want these little things sticking out. 
Um, they don't really stick out on the front, but you can fold them back and they'll stick out a little bit uh, if that matters. Okay, and here we are at the back. A uh, lot of space up here for case fans. I believe there's nothing in these two, but there is a case fan here. I don't think there's anything up in this top area. Uh, power supply here. I may have replaced the power supply. Maybe the original was bad. Um, I think I maybe vaguely remember replacing it. I've had this machine sitting around for quite some time. This is, I'm just now getting around to doing a video on it. But yeah, I think I, I may have replaced this. I'm not sure. We'll take a look at the um, wattage and stuff uh, when we get into it. Of course, um, mouse and keyboard, PS2, uh, USB, I believe they're 2.0 uh, parallel and serial ports. Of course, that's our A bit BP6. Uh, here's our different cards. We'll take a look at those when I open it up and, and go over them then. So here we are inside this massive uh, beast of a case. Uh, so here's that power supply. There's a 400 watt uh, supply, more than enough I believe for this build. Um, see a lot of this empty space in the top here. Uh, only one fan. Could install two more. Um, I kind of feel like I want to just because, but like it's really not I don't know what the point is being up here. It's not like this thing's giving off a ton of heat anyways, and it's just going to make it louder. Um, but, I don't know. It would be cool, I guess. Uh, here's our hard drive. Caddies don't even know if there's hard drives in them. And our CD drives. And then here is our motherboard. Uh, like I said, we already went over this board, so uh, I'm just going to take a quick... Uh, overview of it real quick but yeah we've got a uh, nice cooler master uh, heat sink and fans on these CPUs uh, these are the fastest uh, Celerons uh, officially for this board at 533 megahertz um, now you would think you would think if like the 300 333 megahertz could be overclocked to like 550 you would think these 533 megahertz ones would overclock really well too like uh well, I think they have a times 8 multiplier, uh, pump up the front side bus to 100, 800 megahertz. But uh, I don't think they're, they're great overclockers from what I read. We might get 600 megahertz out of them. Um, I don't know. Without replacing all these caps and stuff, uh, I don't know. It might, not, <laughs> it might not even do 600, but uh, maybe it will. We'll, we'll see. Um, what else do we have here? Yeah. Well, this board here actually has a fan on the, the chipset here, uh, where the other one I had didn't have a fan there. Though I'm not, I'm not really sure how much those uh, BX chipsets heat up. Uh, we do have RAM installed. I think this is like 380-something, uh, just mixed RAM. I'll probably replace that. I'll probably max this board out uh, and just get matching RAM. Uh, let's see, what is this guy, how's it, we've got a full, actual PC speaker there, uh, what else do we have, uh, it looks like he's using a mix between the ATA 66 and 33, I believe that's for the hard drives, uh, here, here is the video card I've installed, it's a Matrux, uh, G400 Max, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, what else do we have here, there's a network card. I never use those, but I'll probably just leave it in there anyways. Here's the SCSI card. I uh, kind of up in the air if I'm gonna remove that or or leave it in. I'm kind of going with the workstation theme here with this build, so I might leave it, but I don't know. It just I feel like it just complicates things at this point. Here's our sound blaster. Uh, Sound Blaster Live. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, we talked about how this board has the uh, Sound Blaster link cable. Creative themselves, I believe, only made one uh, sound card that actually even had a connector for that cable. I believe that was the AW64 PCI version. I think that's the only creative card that even had the Sound Blaster link uh, header on it. So, stupid. It's like they sabotage themselves. Um, although there are other cards from other companies that have that Sound Blaster link. Uh, the Soundluster Live apparently is not one of them. And then here we just have a, that USB card right there. So, I guess the next step will just be cleaning this up a little bit. Um, just figuring out what cards I want to keep. Um, I guess probably all of them. I'm probably just going to go with the, 
the Sound Blaster live as well. I, I'm not sure. Um, so I guess I'll decide that, and then we'll kind of go from there. So here is our Matrux uh, G400 Max. So this is the high-end offering from Matrux for the G400 series. And we've looked at this card in pretty decent detail uh, in older videos. Uh, the reason I wanted to use this card again in this build is just because it kind of fit. Um, Matrux cards are kind of seen as more uh, professional workstation e uh, video cards rather than than gaming cards and that's kind of what I'm going with this build although they were significant in the gaming field too I mean this card uh, the G200 the the Matrix Millennium and Mystiques were all pretty good cards uh, for gaming this card has excellent uh, image quality um, and I think this is an underrated card. I think this card stacks up well against the higher end competition from, you know, 1999. Uh, I think this card competes well with the, the Voodoo 3, 3500 and 3000. I believe this card competes, uh, you know, pretty well against the TNT 2 Ultra. Um, maybe not as good in most situations, but if you have the correct drivers, I believe the early drivers were terrible, but if you use the later drivers, this card you know, holds its own against those high-end cards. So, um, I think this is a pretty decent pick. And, you know, not the best pick, uh, maybe, especially if you're going for absolute all-out uh, performance. Um, but I think it's a, this is a still a good gaming card. And I think it fits this build uh, well as sort of a gaming card slash workstation server sort of theme. Um, so that's why I went again with the G400 Max. Again, if you're doing a similar build, there are plenty uh, of cards uh, you can use that may fit your needs better. Uh, maybe you're just not going with any kind of theme. You want to go straight out performance. You know, throw in a Voodoo 3, uh, 3000 or 3500 or even throw in a GeForce uh, 2MX card or something like that. But do keep in mind that the AGP port on the BP6 uh, is only times 2 AGP, so keep that in mind. Okay, so I pulled out those uh, uh, removable hard drive bays, and there are no hard drives in there, so this machine definitely needs a hard drive. Um, these bays, this one, one of them is IDE, and actually the other one is SCSI. Um, there was the keys, well, I had that was my key I had, and there was a key in each of them, and then one of them had this thing in there and I don't know what that is except maybe a blank um, if you want the bay but you don't you can you can put that in there it actually I got it to, it actually fits pretty nicely I don't know what that is um, so yeah I don't <laughs> I don't know what to do I it's because he makes sense for this build sort of for the theme I'm doing but I don't I don't know if I want to overcomplicate this build with like scuzzy so uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure what I'm gonna do yet. At least hard drive wise, I will probably just throw in like an IDE drive. I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about this one. Like I said, this doesn't make sense for the theming I'm going with, but I, do I really want to overcomplicate this build? All right, so I've spent probably the better part of a day. Uh, day and a half working on this machine. I think I finally got it to a point where we can start testing uh, some games on it. And uh, I ran into a lot of challenges. Um, namely, I, I had a lot of trouble installing the OS. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but I am, I'm going with Windows 2000. Um, yeah, I think I did mention it earlier. Um, so Windows 2000, I was having a ton of problems. OS wouldn't install. Uh, kept locking up and then the computer would just restart itself. Uh, I even installed the OS on the hard drive in a different computer, and I put it in this machine, and it would just it would start to load, and then it would just restart. Uh, eventually, I just figured out it was a bad hard drive, so I replaced uh, the hard drive. I put in a different hard drive, installed Windows 2000, and installed just fine. Um, so uh, right now, I have a 40 gigabyte hard drive in there. I wanted to go for a little bit larger a uh, hard drive for the time. I think it's from like 2002 or 2003. It's a Western Digital. Um, so it's still around the era, a little bit newer, but it's still, you know, in that era, uh, IDE, uh, 40 gigabyte drive. Um, I'll reveal the drives here. I didn't go too crazy, uh, but I added a zip drive. Uh, here's our hard drive. 
Uh, I threw in a Plex store uh, DVD drive, and then I have this. Uh, I believe this is a brand new. I found it at uh, Goodwill, like complete in the box, and everything was in there. I don't think it's ever been used. It's just a, a CDRW uh, drive, and it works beautifully. It has this kind of weird look too. It's not a standard. It like bulges out a little bit, so it's a little bit weird. Um, I, I, I could have complicated this thing a lot, uh, but I decided not to. I removed the SCSI uh, just to keep things simple. So it's, it's a working man's workstation. Can't afford that expensive uh, SCSI. Um, I did have some weird issues. Um, namely, I had a, a lot of issues just getting these all recognized. Getting these all recognized by the computer. Uh, for whatever reason, like putting two on on a on a cable like master slave configuration was was tripping this machine up. It could be many many issues. It could be human error on my part. I've built a lot of computers at this point, but you know it's always possible with human error. But um, it could be could be certain capacitors uh, at certain spots. I mean, this board has not been recapped and it's twenty plus years old. But the issue was. I was just having a lot of issues with putting two devices uh, in one IDE uh, connector. I mean, theoretically, this machine can handle eight devices because uh, I've got four uh, IDE connectors in there on the motherboard, and it should be two each, but I was just having trouble. So I just put uh, one each. Uh, so I just put one each. So each of these is a single drive on its own IDE controller. Um, and I mean, theoretically, I guess that's the best way to go uh, as far as like speed and complication wise and everything. <clears throat> Although that does make it a little bit messy in there because now instead of just two cables for four drives, I have four cables, uh, one for each drive. So, so technically it's like they're all their own uh, masters. <clears throat> um, I believe only the, this, the CD drive and the zip drive are on that ATA66, the high point controller. Uh, if the, you know, preferably you would want the hard drive on that one since it's the fastest and that, that really counts most with the hard drive here, but for whatever reason, it would detect it, but it would not boot. Uh, even though in the BIOS, there are settings to boot from that high point controller with a hard drive, it would recognize it and then it would start to boot and then it would lock up every time. So uh, instead of, you know, spending whatever amount of time messing around with that, I just put it on the ATA33 uh, controller, and I mean, that's that's fine. There's probably not that much of a speed difference, realistically, uh, anyways, that you would notice. Correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, last issue is, for whatever reason, uh, I, I left that Ethernet card installed, and... Uh, um, I just couldn't quite find the drivers for it. Even looking and, and testing different drivers, it's just not working. And uh, I'm sure the drivers for it are out there, but I'm not going to waste more time looking for it. And it's, I'm never going to use it. It's just eating resources anyways. It was just in there to fill a slot. So I'm, I'm just going to I just remove that in the end. Um, the other weird thing is my USB card in there. It's just a regular four-port NEC USB card. It is also not working. It's just, just none of these. It's hooked up here to the front. None of these work. None of the USB ports on that card work. Now, USB does work on the built-in, the two built-in USB ports on the back uh, that are on the motherboard itself. But that USB card just isn't working. You can put in a USB stick, and it just doesn't recognize anything connected to it. Again. It should be relatively simple to find drivers for it. Uh, Windows 2000, I would assume, would have the drivers just built in, but for whatever reason, it's not working. And um, it's just it's just not a big deal. I, I, I'll probably in the future try to get that working. I either replace that card or just hunt down drivers. Uh, try to figure out what's going on with that. But, you know, for the sake of getting this video done and out, uh, I think we're just going to let that go for now. Um, since it's not really impeding our ability to benchmark and play games. All right, so with that all out of the way, uh, let's look at some, some games on this guy.
Alright, and here we go, uh, posting here. Take a look at the bottom at the bio screen. If you take a look at the bo very bottom all the way to the right, if you see a little RU at the end, I believe that means you have the most up-to-date uh, BIOS. Um, I do have the most up-to-date BIOS uh, running on this machine, which I also believe is necessary to support the Celeron 533. Um, so before we get into Windows here, uh, let's take a quick look at the BIOS itself. All right, and here we are in the BIOS. The BIOS for the BP6 is actually quite capable. It has a lot of options, and this is one I really like. It's the um, soft menu too, and this lets you really easily set your uh, parameters for your CPU. You can uh, set the voltage down below, uh, but you can easily in the BIOS here you can set your front side bus and your uh, your CPU speed. And that's it's really nice. Right now we're just going with the default settings for this CPU, uh, times eight multiplier, 66 megahertz front side bus. But there's a lot of different options. You can change your um, the the AGP bus there, and uh, you, there's also you can even like fine tune it even by one uh, megahertz with some of the settings or just a couple. It's 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 a pretty capable uh, I guess overclocking BIOS. Uh, even though unfortunately with some of these uh, Celerons you can't really, they're not really great uh, overclockers. We'll take a look at that later. But other than that, you know, it has all your usual features. Uh, maybe even a little bit, it, it, it's much more capable than a lot of BIOS I've seen. There's actually a lot of options and things you can mess around with. Alright, now we're going to do, well, you know, the usual, my usual checks uh, looking at CPU ID here. And uh, with this motherboard, with this setup, I had some issues with CPU ID as far as it was detecting the the um, front side bus and the CPU speed wrong. It was, uh, it, for some reason it was telling me my bus speed was like 71, 72 uh, megahertz and it was giving me a core speed of, you know, almost 600 megahertz. Um, Everything else seemed to check out, but for whatever reason, uh, CPU-Z was just was kind of goofing up there. Uh, I think maybe it was because I, it's a dual uh, CPU setup. Maybe it wasn't expecting that, or it, maybe it's just this version of CPU-Z. Um, maybe has a problem with SMP setups, where it was just seems to really have been uh, confusing uh, the program on just like CPU speed and front side bus. If we look at Everest Home Edition here, it does give us the correct readings, uh, it does detect the two CPUs, and it does give us the correct uh, CPU speed and front side bus speed. And uh, before I forget about it, if you are running Windows 2000 um, or similar setup like this, make sure you install the latest Service Pack. I installed Service Pack 4 and uh, it did help me, like some games like Quake 3 uh, weren't, uh, wouldn't run it. Uh, until I updated the service pack. I think it has something to do with updated OpenGL uh, drivers or things like that. As for our uh, synthetic benchmarks, uh, running 3D Mark 2000, we got 1,406 marks. And for running 3D Mark 2001 SE, we've got a fairly low 546 marks. Alright, so let's take a look at a couple more games real quick, and then we'll take a look at Quake 3, uh, which should be playable on this machine and also supports the dual processors.
Alright, so let's take a look at Quake 3 here. I am running all these benchmarks and gameplay at high quality settings, 800 by 600 with 32 bit color. Uh, so Quake 3 yeah, is one of those early games that does have the ability to take advantage of the dual processors. Uh, it does have an SMP mode uh, if you enter a certain command line. Um, so that command line is R bottom slash SMP space 1. Uh, that is to enable the SMP mode and then to disable it if you have it enabled is R bottom slash SMP uh, 0. Keep in mind I think only certain versions of the game uh, have this mode. I, I think the earliest versions may not actually have the mode. Um, and uh, going through a lot of forum posts, I think I was lucky. It seemed to work for the most part for me, uh, but I've read a lot of people where this it can be kind of buggy. Uh, it can bug out the game. Uh, it could do strange things, so it might give you issues. Again, this was kind of the early days of Figuring out how to do, you know, uh, multi-processors, uh, SMP processing within a game. Uh, and uh, maybe an example of that is my early benchmarks, running the Quake 3 benchmark. It was kind of weird. Um, when I actually ran it in regular mode, uh, just utilizing one CPU, I got uh, 42.3 FPS. And uh, when I ran the same benchmark in SMP mode... Uh, I got 33.7, um, so that's a good bit lower. It should have been faster, uh, but when I went and I did gameplay and I had fraps running, it seems like my numbers were a little bit higher in SMP mode, and it, it felt a little bit smoother and faster, although it's a little bit inconclusive, but I do think the SMP mode when I was in actual gameplay was a little bit faster, uh, so that's kind of weird. Uh, later on, uh, I do test some different video cards, and that problem went away. Uh, I was just consistently just getting better uh, frame rates in SMP mode, so it might have something to do with the Matrix card and weird interactions with the Matrix driver. I'm not sure, uh, but just keep in mind the SMP mode can be a little bit buggy. So where do we go for now with this build? You know, I'm not done with this machine. Um, it was interesting seeing how it performed in a more period correct uh, 1999-2000, but I want to maybe push it a little bit further. So uh, what I've already done, I've already maxed the RAM in this. I think it had like 386, I think the number is. I'm terrible with math. Uh, but it had 300 and something uh, megabytes of RAM. Now I've maxed it out to... The max is like 786. I know how RAM works, it doubles. I'm just really bad with numbers. So it's 700 and something uh, megabytes amount of RAM. So, and that's just fine because we have Windows 2000 on there, and Windows 2000 can take advantage of all that memory. So I think the next thing we need to do is just kind of max out the video card as much as we can. And as I said, the Matrix uh, G400 Max. I think it's an underrated graphics card. I, I think it's it's a pretty good card, but but I like to put something a little more powerful in there uh, to make sure that the graphics card isn't um, you know bottlenecking those CPUs. I want to see what those uh, dual CPUs can really do. So I'm going to put something a little more powerful in there, and uh, I think I'm going to attempt to install a GeForce 4. I believe this is the times four or times eight. Uh, I forget. I think it's actually a times eight uh, speed AGP card. Now the AGP slot in this uh, on this motherboard is only times two, so we're not getting the full power of this card. But this card should be significantly more powerful than our uh, G400 Max. Uh, I am a little concerned with like voltage because it is early AGP or earlier AGP. Um, so I think the voltage is a little different. But from what I've researched, uh, this card should be backwards compatible. So it should work because I know there's what like 1.0 voltage AGP and then there's 3.3, something like that. Um, but I, I think this is one of the last cards that will be compatible with the older AGP slot. Uh, we'll install it and I'll cross my fingers and uh, hopefully it will work. And then we'll do uh, we'll do some benchmarks again and we'll see uh, we'll see the improvement in the games. Another thing about the GeForce 4 is it actually released in 2002. So, as far as era and time-wise, it's actually not too ridiculously far off 
uh, from our motherboard kind of time period era. So uh, that's another plus. And so I discovered the DVD drive um, I had installed wasn't working. It was that PlexTor DVD drive. Unfortunately, it just wasn't working. Um, I put in another DVD drive, a Pioneer DVD drive, and that also failed to work. And then this uh, creative drive I just had sitting around uh, seems to work. I mean, technically, I believe it's the oldest and the slowest of all of them, but this one seems to work. It's, it's uh, 12 times. It's from 2000. It's our time period. Um, it's not the most reliable drive. It's not the fastest drive, but it seems to be working. Okay, let's take a look at a few garish uh, charts here. Uh, the first one, just taking a quick look at two of those synthetic benchmarks, 3D Mark. Uh, 2000 and 3D Mark 2001 Special Edition and as we can see with the GeForce 4 the results are predictably much higher than with the G400 Max. In uh, 3D Mark 2000 we are now getting 2,396 marks and a big improvement with 3D Mark 2001 SE we are now getting 3,756 uh, marks on average compared to with the Matrux Max we are getting a measly 546 marks. As can be expected uh, pretty much all the games I tested ran uh, much better uh, than they did with the Matrux uh, Max uh, though I would have to say that the CPU are still holding things back. Um, you know, you can put in the most powerful card in the universe, but you're still going to have uh, some, you know, 533 megahertz uh, Celerons in there running on a 66 megahertz front side bus. Quake 3 displayed noticeable improvement this time around with uh, SMP mode enabled. Uh, in non-SMP mode, I was getting about uh, 59 FPS when running the benchmark, but after enabling SMP mode, I was getting about 72 FPS average. I did attempt to play Quake 4, knowing full well the requirements of that game were probably a little bit too much for this system to handle, and I knew it wouldn't play well, but it actually didn't run at all, uh, because the CPUs just lacked the instructions required to play Quake 4. Uh, you know, and that's part of the problem, is around this time, I think like 2005, when games finally started to support, you know, SMP, multiple CPUs, or, you know, dual cores and multiple cores, it just the CPUs were just woefully outdated by that point. So before we wrap this video up, I wanted to do some quick uh, overclocking and some stability benchmark tests. Um, and I'm going to, for the third time, actually change the video card again. I've had this video card just kicking around in my stash for a while now, and I, I wanted to put it in something, and I think it fits this machine just right. Um, I do like the Matrix card we initially had in there. I think that's a good fit for it. Uh, but I don't know, I wanted something a little bit different, uh, maybe something a little more powerful. The GeForce 4 is, is a bit much. Um, I mean, it works fine in there, it gives it a really nice boost, but I don't know, it feels, it feels a little much for that CPU. So I wanted to put this guy in there, and this I believe is a GeForce 2 uh, MX. I'm not exactly sure uh, which model exactly. I believe it's 64 megabytes. I think this is one of the better ones. Um, so I guess we'll see. There's not really any labeling on it except the, the WinFast. I think this is a lead tech card. Um, so this should have uh, TNL abilities. It should be faster than the Matrix card, but uh, we'll put it in. We'll run uh, power strip and stuff and we'll check it out. So I really love the little splash screen that comes up <laughs> with this uh, video card installed. But anyways, we did get lucky with this card. I did discover it is the MX400, so it's the good one. Uh, it's about equivalent to a GeForce 256, but at the quarter of a price uh, of one of those cards. So uh, got lucky. This is one of the good GeForce 2 MXs. And just one more uh, garish chart here to suffer through, um, but this is comparing the synthetic benchmarks with all of the three cards I've tested, and as, as uh, you could figure, the GeForce 2 MX comes in between the GeForce 4 and the Matrux uh, 400 Max. It's surprising in 3D Mark 2000, though, how, 
how close like the the GeForce 2 MX and the GeForce 4 is. But then when we get the 3D Mark uh, 2001 SE, it's the GeForce 4 is just super far ahead, and the GeForce 2 MX is is about where I would think it would be. It's it's a bit ahead of the uh, the Max, but it's not like too far ahead. It's maybe maybe double, maybe a little more than double uh, the marks uh, there. Finally, I want to do some light overclocking uh, using the soft menu 2 in the BIOS. And I'm going to change the front side bus to 75 megahertz. Now with the times 8 multiplier, uh, that should bring us up to 600 megahertz. Um, now I did discover that without upping the voltage, uh, it worked, but I would get lockups. Um, so uh, just increasing the voltage a little bit to uh, 2.1 volts. Uh, made everything very nice and stable, so I was able to get it running at 600 megahertz with the 75 megahertz uh, front side bus. Uh, anything higher than that, though, and it, it either wouldn't even post or it would just be completely unstable. And that's expected with these uh, Celeron 533 megahertz chips. They weren't the most spectacular overclockers. And about 600 megahertz with the 75 megahertz front side bus is usually about the best you could hope for. I'm not gonna make your eyes bleed with another one of those charts. Um, I mostly just, I wasn't really looking at the benchmark results so much as I just wanted to see if I could get this system uh, stable uh, with the overclock, and I, I certainly did. Um, although the results, you know, they weren't that much higher than at 533 megahertz. Um, just to go over it real quick, at the 600 megahertz overclock with 3D Mark 2000, we got a score of 2,494, and with 3D Mark uh, 2001 SE, it was uh, 1473. Uh, Quake 3 results weren't they were they were less than with the GeForce 4. Um, but between SMP mode and non-SMP mode, there was very little difference. I think I got like 65 or 66 uh, FPS in non-SMP mode. And under SMP mode, it was about 68 uh, FPS. So not a huge difference there uh, between the modes. And just as a final touch, I uh, remembered I had one of these older style Intel Inside uh, Celeron stickers, so slap that on the case there. So what are my thoughts on the A-Bit uh, BP6 build here, and the, generally just speaking about the motherboard itself? And honestly, to me, it's just, it's kind of a novelty. I mean, it's cool. Uh, and it has its purposes. I mean, it was a cheap solution to get something pretty powerful back then. Um, but really, looking at it from a gaming point of view, it's definitely a novelty. I could have seen in the day, uh, it would have been helpful with maybe like CAD or certain productivity uh, programs and things like that. But, you know, we're looking at this from the year 2022. And we're not talking about, you know, embedded industrial systems that need older tech. I'm just talking about the average Joe that does this as a hobby. And no one is buying and building old computers to run old productivity software, or even CAD. By and large, I'm sure there's a couple out there. But generally, gaming is the focus. So looking at this motherboard from a gaming perspective... It, it, it's just a novelty, and um, it's a good board, and it was decent for its time. But here's my issues with it. For older OSs like DOS and Windows 95 and 98, it's pointless. It, the gimmick of the dual CPUs just is, is pointless, since those operating systems just don't support uh, the dual CPUs. So the whole gimmick of the board is lost on that. Um, now, there are a few that you can use, like Windows XP and Windows 2000, and even some, uh, you know, versions of Linux and OS 2 uh, will work uh, with the dual CPU. So as far as, like, a, you know, so as far as DOS and Windows 9X, which are by far the most, you know, popular gaming OSs for 90s retro gaming, the gimmick is useless. The dual CPUs just don't work. Now, for Windows 2000 and Windows XP, uh, where it does work, where the dual CPUs do work, you get a little extra oomph in your OS and just scrolling around and doing basic OS stuff, and that is nice, but unfortunately, the Celerons just aren't powerful enough 
really for serious gaming in Windows 2000 or Windows XP. I mean, they're good enough for some stuff and early XP stuff, but it's like you saw with Quake 4, and that is considered an early SMP game. The CPUs just didn't have the instruction code. And as I mentioned, software that takes advantage of the dual CPUs is very limited. We saw Quake 3, uh, and I was lucky with Quake 3. I read a lot of posts where people were having glitches and issues in SMP mode. It worked pretty well for me. That's probably the best example of an older game working in uh, SMP mode. Uh, but there's not, there's just not many games. Falcon 4.0, which I don't have. There's probably a couple others. There's a lot that I've heard are, you know, unconfirmed. I think, like, Dungeon Siege, uh, the first version, may or may not have SMP support. I feel like it sounds like I'm being fairly harsh on the A-bit BP6, and I really don't mean to be. Remember the context of which we're talking about this motherboard. Really, to summarize, this board was kind of ahead of its time. The A-bit BP6 brought multiple processors on a single motherboard to the consumer market at an affordable price. The problem was, there was very little support as far as mainstream OS's go, and software, specifically games, that could take advantage of multiple CPUs. It didn't take long for operating systems to come out which supported more than one uh, CPU. Uh, Windows 2000 came out fairly soon after this board was released, and then following that was Windows XP. But for games that took advantage of multiple CPUs and uh, even single CPUs with multiple cores, it took a little bit longer. By the time those games came out, these CPUs were quite outdated, and they really couldn't run uh, many of those games. Uh, even if even if speed alone wasn't an issue, as we've seen, they just didn't have the instruction sets in there. Now, you can spend the money, and you can get adapters, and you could upgrade this board a little bit. I've seen people go so far as to put, uh, to put Tualat and Celerons in these machines, and that helps a little bit. But even then, you're still limited by the RAM, the Times 2 AGP, and just the motherboard itself. I think in that case, if you really want dual physical CPUs, you're just better off getting a more modern board. This board was a pioneer in having dual CPUs affordable to the consumer market, but like I said, the support at the time just wasn't there. But that said, I did have a lot of fun uh, doing this video, and I had a lot of fun uh, with this build and setting up this uh, machine and motherboard, but when I was researching this board, um, I read a lot of forum posts, and I read a lot of people that do have fond memories of this board, and they, they did buy it when it originally came out, and they did use it for quite some time, and they did get a lot of utility from it. So I'm not calling it useless, I'm just saying... If you're building a retro gaming rig, I wouldn't make it your first or second or third or maybe even fourth choice uh, unless you have one sitting around. But uh, thank you for watching the video. If you like this kind of content, uh, let me know, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. And Thank you again for watching.